Life is chaotic, isn't it? Fast moving, unpredictable, change happening at supersonic speed. Our world is changing. It's changing beyond recognition. And it's left us trying to anticipate the unknown unknowns. We only have to look at the world around us. A pandemic that locked us into our homes. Unimaginable changes to our workplaces. Climate change impacting on everyday decisions we make. And wars that feel so close and real. News no longer happens to other people. It's happening in real time to each of us. Humankind has entered a new paradigm, one where complexity, uncertainty, and heightened disruption it is our new normal. And it requires us to adapt, to think, to act, to do things differently. Now take a moment and imagine yourself as a passenger on a plane flying through turbulent skies, where you're being buffeted up and down, jolted side to side, not knowing when, or where that next bump is coming from, or indeed, how big is that bump going to be? And if you're anything like me, you're waiting to hear the reassuring voice of the pilot to tell you that everything is OK, that you're safe. Turbulence can be scary, even for those of us who are OK with flying. And I think of turbulence as a great metaphor for life today, because it's a pretty bumpy journey, and there isn't the absence of fear. I have my own experience of being in that turbulence, turning up every day to life as a worn out passenger. Chronic overwhelm was my normal, a daily undercurrent of fatigue. I'd lost my sense of purpose, my sense of direction. Life was happening to me. My family, they jokingly, they refer to it as the time Georgie lost her smile. Because I am a happy person, but there was a period in my life where I couldn't get it back. And so what did I do? I continued to board that same plane, to get on that same flight every day, because I didn't know what an alternative pathway looked like. I didn't know another way to be. And in the absence of any kind of real strategy, I developed one of hope, which saw me going faster, working harder, doing more, actively creating the conditions I said I didn't want. And there were consequences. You think the thyroid issues, the miscarriages, or even the skin cancer would have been a good enough reason to pause, to stop, to take stock. Our bodies whispered to us. My body was whispering to me. It was lighting roadside flares, desperately trying to get my attention. And what did I do? I put my fingers in my ears. I blocked it out. And it took a total burnout. And my doctor telling me in no uncertain terms that if I didn't change my ways of being, my ways of living, I wouldn't see my children grow up. That time, the message landed. It was the catalyst I needed to make meaningful changes into my life. Changes that I could do for other people, Yet up until that point, I hadn't been able to make them for myself. And here's the thing. The most important relationship we have is with ourselves. And yet often, it's the most neglected. Take a moment and consider your own priority list. Where do you feature? Your top 10? Top 110? Or do you even feature? Surviving in this modern world is difficult enough. Thriving is another thing altogether. It requires us to be purposeful, intentional, and doing the work. And I did the work. I created a new pathway. I took a step back. I stopped making excuses that I didn't have time. And I reconnected back to me. To understand who was I, what brought me alive, what was the impact that I wanted to have in the world? And I became a coach and a trusted advisor. And these days, I have the very great fortune to work with some extraordinary human beings, global leaders, change makers, visionaries, people who are changing the world, revolutionizing industries, 
disrupting technologies, driving systemic change. People who are thriving in today's world. Being invited behind the curtain, I've seen what and how they do it. I've learned the critical lessons. And one of my key learnings, their impact, their influence, their fulfillment in life is not by chance. It's by design. They've developed a robust toolkit, tested and iterated over time and through experience. And I've distilled my learnings from these industry titans into three core lessons. Three lessons for thriving in today's world, whether you carry that formal title of leader or not. And there is one core theme which underpins all three lessons. Self-leadership. Conscious choice making, having a sense of purpose, switching off autopilot, taking the controls and flying that plane, not being the passenger. So when life does get bumpy, which look inevitably will, we have the tools to thrive emotionally, physically, mentally. Self-leadership is the key ingredient to thriving in today's world. And where do we begin? Where does it start? With our first lesson, with a desire and a willingness to hold the mirror up. It requires us to go within to really see ourselves. Who am I? Who am I is a seemingly simple question and much harder to answer in person. Who am I? For me, like, who am I when I'm not wearing the labels of mother, wife, coach, leader, friend? Are you living the life you want that makes you feel alive? Or are you simply sleepwalking through and existing? Who is the author of your story? Who is holding the pen? When you change the questions you ask yourself, you change your experience of life. And I call that self-reflection. And self-reflection for me is much like doing a spring clean of your home. So imagine you're walking into your sitting room and you're stopping, you're pausing, and you're looking around to seeing what's in there. And as you look around, you notice. And some of those things you notice for the first time. And you determine what needs throwing away, organizing, storing, holding on to, polishing. When we apply this spring clean to our mind, what does it give us? Space, perspective, clarity and insight on what to focus on and on what needs our attention. And self-reflection is just one part of the journey because we can have the best insights. Maybe it's, I need to phone my mum more. I need to be, do a better job at managing my people-pleasing tendencies. That's me as well. We can have insights, we can have attention, we can have greater levels of awareness. And then it's what we do with those insights. Knowing and doing are two distinct things. Execution matters. And the thing with self-reflection, it can be accessed by anyone, anytime, anywhere. It simply requires you to be curious, open and maybe even a little bit playful. And this takes us to our second lesson. There is power in the pause, to taking a breath, to taking a moment, and being present and recognizing what is within your control and influence and what isn't. Invariably, we can find ourselves firefighting the daily unforeseen events. Unpredictability means we've lost the luxury of time to think, to plan, and prepare. You know what? That can leave us in a reactionary mode, which is very normal. We're, we're biologically wired to be triggered in life. There is a discernible difference between a knee-jerk reaction and a considered response with two potentially very, very different outcomes. This one over here, led by emotion, here, thoughtful and conscious. 
In the words of author Charles Swindle, life is 10% what happens to you. 90% is how you respond. 90%. When you pause, you have the power, the power to choose your mindset, to choose your attitude, to choose your response. That is within your gift. An event could be a C minus. When you pause, you have the ability to achieve an A-plus response. Take a moment and think about where are those C-minus events showing up in your life, where if you took a pause, if you took time, you could get to that A-plus response. Also within our gift, making time for ourselves. I think of the passing of time like holding on to a handful of sand. However tightly you grip it, it will inevitably fall through your fingers. Time flies and is easy to squander because there will always be people, devices competing for your attention. It requires us to take self-responsibility, to schedule uninterrupted time, yes, uninterrupted time with ourselves the most important relationship we have, remember, is with ourselves. And that time being non-negotiable, not the item in your diary that is the ever movable one. And maybe that's going for a dog walk. Maybe that's reading a book. Maybe that's doing a crossword. Leaders I work with call this white space their strategic thinking time. I think of it as their snow globe time. Now, if we imagine in my snow globe here. Every snowflake represents someone important to you, a decision you need to make, an urgent item on your to-do list. In the midst of a snowstorm, it is difficult to see with clarity. And as the snow settles, you gain perspective. Things become clearer. Making time for yourself isn't time out. It's time invested. You've got to take agency, schedule it, prioritize it, and fiercely protect it. And protecting it is key, because there will always be people trying to compete for your attention. There's a lesson it took me in my 40s to realize. We can't do everything. We can't please everyone. We can't buy more hours in the day we can choose how we spend them. I've worked with leaders on the switch from FOMO, the fear of missing out, wanting to be involved in everything, struggling to say no, over-yesing, over-committing, to JOMO, the joy of missing out, resulting in more time for health and self. Remember that before you say yes to something, you will be saying no to something else. So don't RSVP yes to the party you really don't want to go to. And that can be difficult for the people pleasers amongst us. And don't treat every incoming message with equal importance. Your time, your attention, your energy are precious, precious non-renewable resources. Don't let others steal them from you. Equally, do not freely give them away. And this also means reflecting on our habits, because we have good habits, and then we have the not-so-good ones over here. Your habits will drive you forward, or they will hold you back and keep you stuck. I think of bad habits as wombats, activities which are a waste of money, brains, and time. And that might be mindlessly scrolling on social media, going to bed too late, drinking that extra glass of wine. This is where that self-reflection comes in, to really determine what are the habits and behaviors that are a complete energy suck for me. And then it's about having a plan, instilling new habits. And it takes time, practice, patience, perseverance. It means you've got to do the work. Take the controls, switch off autopilot. The third lesson, have a trusted circle. Life can be lonely. 
it can feel isolating. And there is a big difference between feeling alone and actually being alone. Surround yourself with a tribe. Create your own trusted outlet. I call mine my power posse. It's like having my own internal board of directors. Choose people you trust, who have your best interests at heart, and who wear the hats of truth teller, sounding board, champion, challenger, individuals who'll be your checks and balance. And this will include friends, family members, colleagues. But that's a trusted outlet that will give you a space to have the conversations you don't get to elsewhere, a place to vent, a place to release the pressure valve, and a place to step out of the chaos of life and into the calm. Life is chaotic. Heightened disruption is our new normal. And we don't have to accept that. We can assume our choices, our actions, when isolated, don't make a difference in the world. But they do. Every action creates a ripple. I think of ROI as ripple of impact. It's the small changes that compound that lead to the big shifts over time. And there's the ones that will magnify into the outside world. We are the conscious creator of our life and our experiences. It all starts with self-leadership. So what are you going to take agency for? What is the first small step you will take towards self-leadership mastery?